chapter 8. Number 1. What does verse 1 describe? Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. So the answer is the seventh seal. And we're not going to spend any time on this last, because we covered that last month, right? That's when everybody leaves heaven to come down with Jesus. <coughs> The Bible says all the holy angels will be with him. There won't be anybody left in heaven, and it will be quiet up there. And somebody asked me, well, will we get to heaven in a half hour? No, 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 no. We aren't, we can't travel that fast. I mean, we could, but it'd scare us to death. <laughs> it's like, you know, when I was a boy, my brother bought a Corvette. And he went to take my grandpa for a ride. Oh, and my grandpa had a 43 Oldsmobile, and he'd never driven more than 40 miles an hour in his life. Oh. And my ornery brother put him in that Corvette and went down the road 150 miles an hour. <laughs> that was me. It scared my grandpa to death. And God is not going to scare us. We're not used to traveling near that fast. So it'll probably take us, it'll probably take us a week to get to heaven. But the angels will all come to be here for the grand finale, and then once we've gone to meet Jesus and run away, then they'll go dashing back to heaven because, you know, we can't, we can't let heaven sit idle. That's the center of the universe. But for a half hour at least, there won't be anybody there. Question number two. What line of prophecy does verse two introduce? Verse two, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So the answer is the seven trumpets. Seven trumpets. Now I want to review a little bit. Recapitulistic history. You like that word, don't you? You're getting so you can say it. Recapitulistic history. Now we can see what it means. First of all, we studied the seven churches. And we found that that was a prophecy of the spiritual condition of the Christian church from the time of John to the end. Then we did a recapitulism. We backed up and we studied the seven seals. And we found that that was a prophecy of the evangelistic proclamation of the Christian church in the fall of history from John to the end. Now we're backing up for the second recapitulism, we're going to back up and do the seven trumpets. And we're going to find that the seven trumpets was a prophecy of the punishment that God would allow to come on his people because they didn't obey him. And in the last several nights, we've seen a lot about how they didn't obey him. Question number three, what wonderful assurance do we find in verse three and four? And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Now you remember, we studied that last night, that every one of your sincere prayers that you've ever prayed didn't just bounce against the ceiling. It got to heaven, and it's been stored there in a very special place like you used to store your sweetheart's love letters. And so it reviews that again here, and the answer is our prayers are constantly before God very special to him. Our prayers are constantly before God. And this is really the theme of Revelation as you're, as you're picking it up here, that God is just intimately in tune with his people. Now, question number four says, review. So we're going to review just a bit more before we jump into the seven trumpets. It says, review. The seven churches portray the spiritual, write that in the blank, the spiritual condition of the church in the seven eras of history. So the seven churches portray the spiritual condition of the church in the seven eras of history. The seven
seven seals portray the gospel outreach of the church in the seven eras of history. So this is another way of looking at our recapitulism. These are the seven eras of history, the apostolic age, the early church, the fall of Rome, medieval times, the reformation, modern era, and the final era. And we found that Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, that was the prophecy of the spiritual condition during these eras. Then when we studied the seals, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse, etc., that was a prophecy of the gospel proclamation. Now they don't exactly die. The pale horse is the uh, gospel proclamation during the Dark Ages. There were two churches during the Dark Ages. Thyatira covers both of these times, the natural disasters under the seal, and the seventh seal is silent. But remember I told you when we were doing here that the final era is very, very short. Okay? Question. Um, when you were covering the, the earthquake and the sun going mm -hmm. dark, um, I don't remember anything about the moon turning to blood or as well. Okay, if we would back up just a moment, when we were covering the sun being dark and the moon turning to blood, I, I, I did miss that. The same day that the sun was darkened, which was May 19, 1780, and the sun went out at 10 o'clock, that night was a full moon. And that night, the full moon gave absolutely no light. The, the accounts, the eyewitnesses' accounts that I've read describe it as a full moon, like a big drop of blood up in the sky. And they say that people could take a black piece of cloth and a white piece of cloth and hold it up to the full moon and you couldn't tell the difference between the two pieces of cloth. And so it was just a nice follow. Good question. Number five, preview. The seven trumpets portray the disasters. You want to write disaster in that line. God allows to come on people as a result of their disobedience and as an alarm to wake them up. So the seven trumpets that we're going to start now portray the disasters that God allows to come on people as a result of their disobedience and as an alarm to wake them up. Okay, question number six. After presenting prayers to God in the censer, what does the angel do? Verse five. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and a great earthquake. So the answer is, he filled it with fire from the altar. That would be holy fire because it came from God's altar. So this is, this is holy fire. This is, and cast it to the earth. He filled it with fire from the altar. He filled it with holy fire and cast it to the earth. This is teaching us that while God is in heaven and mankind and Satan are down on this earth, and to a large extent, Satan is the ruler of this earth. Jesus said when he was here, the prince of this world cometh and findeth nothing to me. Jesus referred to Satan as the prince of the power of the air. All these disasters that happen, happen because Satan makes them happen. But God is holding them back, we saw that. And here an angel throws the fire down there. God is, God still is able to set limits, is what it's telling, okay? Now, this fire, this fire that goes to the earth, number seven says, how did God describe his pleadings with his people? Let's go back in history and find what this fire is a symbol of. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 16. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 16. And this is a prophecy of the end of time. Isaiah 66, 16 says, For by fire and by his sword will the Lord please with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. So God says his pleadings is by fire and by a sword. It's, it's kind of the old thing that's out of style now. You know, when I was a boy, it's a good thing that they didn't have the social services they do now. Because if 
if they'd have social services like they do now, I wouldn't be standing here teaching you. I'd be in prison. Because I pled with my kids. When my kids were ornery, first I would talk to them, and then I would plead with them with a hickory. <coughs> you understand what I mean? <laughs> and I sometimes raised marks on their little hiney. And both of them turned out I'm glad I'm not raising kids today. <laughs> so when, when God pleads with people, it, it's his judgment, punishment, is to wake people up and say, you know, come, come around, smarten up here. Number eight, what happened when the first trumpet sounded? Oh, oh, as fire. I'm sorry. How does God describe his pleadings with his people? The answer is as fire. It says he sends fire on the earth. He's pleading with people to repent. He, he's spanking them like, like I spanked my kids. Okay? Number eight. What happened when the first trumpet sounded? Verse six and seven. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. And the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. So let's write it down. The answer, hail, goes in the first blank, hail, fire, and blood. Three, first three blanks. Hail, fire, and blood <coughs> fell on the earth, and one third of the trees and grass was destroyed. Okay, so hail, fire, and blood fell on the earth, and one third of the trees and grass was destroyed. Now we need to identify the symbols. It says a trumpet sounded. So let's go back to in history. Let's go back to Joel, chapter 2, verses 13 to 15, and see if we can find out what a trumpet is, what a trumpet is symbolic of. Joel, chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, it says, And rend your heart and not your garments, and turn into the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and great kindness and repenteth him of evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? So here you see it's a call to repentance, turn and come back to God. Then it says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. They were to sound this trumpet as a call to repentance. And so a trumpet means a call to repentance. A call to repentance. A warning of judgment. Then the next symbol, so, so the trumpet sounded. It was a call to repentance, a warning. Then it says, hail fire and blood. Well, we know what fire is. That's God's pleadings with his people. Let's go to Isaiah 28, 1 and 2. Isaiah 28, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 28, verses 1 and 2. It says, Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm and as a flood of mighty waters overflowing shall cast down to the earth with the hand. The context here is Ephraim. The, the tribe of Ephraim, the nation of Ephraim, was, was just rebelling against the God. And God says, I have a mighty one which like a hail and a flood is going to come and throw you down talking about an invasion, he's talking about warfare. And if you read the whole chapter, you find that an enemy army came to Ephraim and just destroyed the whole place. So hail, fire, and blood is symbolic of warfare. And trees and grass were in Isaiah, or if you're following me in 
Isaiah chapter 44, verses 3 and 4, identifies these symbols. Isaiah 44, 3 and 4. It says, For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up among the grass, as willows, willow trees, by the water courses. So grass and trees represent people. So let's just write people there. Trees and grass represent people. All right, then a summary. The first trumpet is a description of the disasters Jesus would allow to come on the Jewish people. They were his people. That was part of his church. Because they disobeyed him. It was fulfilled when the Roman army destroyed Jerusalem. Many Jews accepted the warning and became believers. And that's what this picture is supposed to represent here. That's the city of Jerusalem. And because his people, Jewish people, were disobedient, God allowed this hail and fire to fall on them in, in terms of the Roman army. And the Roman armies in 70 A.D., came against Jerusalem and completely surrounded the city, laid siege to it. And for three years, not anybody could come in or go out of the city of Jerusalem. Three years with no trips to Safeway. How hungry do you get? This was what was called a siege in the olden days. And as they were there, they would they carried dirt and they built big mounds and they put things that threw rocks over the walls and when those rocks would hit they would of course smash people and they would shoot arrows over the wall and they had you know, like big gobs of tar that they would set on fire and put them on these catapults and go over the wall. It was a horrible time. Finally the Jewish people ran out of food, they ran out of water, there was cannibalism inside the city, they, they began to eat each other, they began to eat their children. And finally, there wasn't strength left, and the Romans broke through the walls, and the Romans crucified one million people. The crosses were so thick around the city of Jerusalem that you could hardly walk between them, and all these rotting corpses rotting away on, on them. It was really the, the end of the Jewish nation as it had been known in, in antiquity. But as a result of that hideous problem, that, that punishment that God allowed to come on them because of their rebellion, their, the, the temple was destroyed, and they were scattered throughout the world, and many individual people repented of their sins and came to the Lord. So, that happened in history. Question number nine. What happened when the second trumpet sounded? Okay. What happened when the second trumpet sounded? Eight and nine. Whoops, I'm in Isaiah. Got to get back to Revelation. Revelation chapter eight and verses eight and nine. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain, burning with fire, was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And a third part of the ships were destroyed. All right, so let's write in the answer. A great mountain, a great mountain burning with fire fell into the sea causing great destruction. Great mountain burning with fire fell into the sea, causing great destruction. So now let's identify the symbols. A destroying mountain. We've got to go back in history. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse 24 and 25. Jeremiah chapter 24 and 25. And the context here, God is speaking to the nation of Babylon. Nation of Babylon, back in ancient history, about 600 B.C., really conquered the whole world with his army. Now God's talking to Babylon. He says, Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain. He calls the nation of Babylon a destroying mountain. 
I am against thee, O destroying mountain, saith the Lord, which destroyeth all the earth. And I will stretch out my hand upon thee and roll down from the rock and will make thee a burnt mountain. And they shall not take of thee a stone for a corner nor a stone for a foundation, but thou shalt be desolate forever, saith the Lord. Babylon was at the height of its glory. It was this heathen nation that was rolling on to conquer the earth. And God says, I'm going to get you, Babylon. You destroying mountain. I'm going to make you a burnt mountain. I'm going to make you desolate forever. And if you remember the news from a few years ago, Babylon is desolate. Old Saddam Hussein was going to rebuild it. He hasn't done it yet. One of the reasons he hasn't done it is because God said it will never be rebuilt. You destroying mountain, I'm going to clear you out forever. So a destroying mountain is a hostile nation. A destroying mountain is a hostile nation. The sea... We read this verse already in Revelation 15. Remember it said, The waters which thou sawest are peoples and multitudes and nations. So we don't need to look that one up. The sea is masses of people. Lots of people. Concentrations of people. Like New York versus Wyoming. So the sea is masses of people. All right. Living creatures. We don't even have... I didn't give you a verse for that, and that's pretty obvious. Living creatures are people, or dogs, or cats, or, you know, living things. And ships. Ships have always been symbolic of commerce. You know, everything that moves from here to China goes on a ship, right? You just want to pay airmail, and that's really expensive. I understand, because I have a Chinese dog at home. <laughs> so, Commerce moves on the ship. So the, the symbols are destroying mountain is a hostile nation. The sea is masses of people. Living creatures are individual people and living things. And ships are possessions. So the second trumpet is a description of the disasters that Jesus would allow to come on Europe, the Christian, the Christian world around the Mediterranean Sea, See my map here? This is the boot of Italy. This is the Mediterranean Sea. And the early church started in Jerusalem. And then under the influence of the Apostle Paul, this whole area of the world became the cradle of the Christian church. It's, it's what we think of as the Roman Empire, although the Roman Empire went way over here and down here and in the end. So uh, the, the Christian part of the Roman Empire, okay? The, the second trumpet is a description of the disasters Jesus was allowed to come on the Roman people because they disobeyed him. You remember the last two nights we've been studying what happened to the church spiritually, what happened to the church gospelly. They really didn't obey him very good, did they? We turned up with a black horse and a pale horse and all that. They weren't obeying Jesus. It was fulfilled when the barbarians invaded the Roman Empire. As a result of the suffering, Many Romans became believers. Along in the three, four hundred, like we were studying when, remember last night I told you about when the emperor finally <coughs> left Rome because he couldn't handle it anymore? All right, the reason that he left were the Huns. Anybody ever heard of Attila the Hun? Yeah, well, now you know where he fits in. Attila the Hun came down from the north and invaded this part of the of the world. And Attila the Hun was so mean that he bragged that grass never grew where his horse stepped. He said, I am the scourge of the earth. I am so mean that grass never grows where my horse walks. And, and I, I'd almost believe it. If you could go back in history, that guy was, I mean, they, him and his men swept in and they just were robbed and plundered and killed and slaughtered and burned and it was awful. And then the Germanic people and the Teutonic people from up in here moved down into the Roman Empire. And, and the Roman Empire really fell apart. God was allowing that to happen really because the Christians weren't doing what they were supposed to do. And God is a father. And good fathers you know, punish their kids because they love them. There comes a point when you talk until you're blue in the face and you have to go a next step. Right? Okay. And so that's what God allowed to happen. 
Question number 10. What happened when the third trumpet sounded? This is verses 10 and 11. Get back to Revelation chapter 8. 10 and 11. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamb. And it fell upon a third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many people died of the waters because they were made bitter. So let's answer the question. A great star named Wormwood. A great star named Wormwood fell on the fountains and rivers, making them wormwood. Many people died as a result. So a great star named Wormwood fell on the fountains and rivers, making them wormwood. Many people died as a result. Now we got to identify these symbols. A star. When it says a star fell. Go back and get it right to the book of Job. Job chapter 38 and verse 7. Job chapter 38 and verse 7. God is talking to Job. And he's asking him, where were you? We're just picking out one verse. Where were you when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? In the context there, morning stars are angels. He said, Joe, where were you when I created the earth? And all my angels were singing for joy. Morning stars are angels. So, a star represents an angel. That's what you want to write in that one. Then, wormwood. Wormwood equals bitterness. You don't find that in the Bible. We find that in history. There was a bush, sort of like what we have around here that we call sagebrush. It was a bush like that that they, and the name of it was wormwood. And, and if you would bite it or get a little bit of it in your mouth or in your eye, it was just, just incredibly bitter. And it was called wormwood. All right, now, so bitterness is, is the answer there, and it was a well-known plant in the Middle East. The angel, the star is an angel, it says he saw a great star fall from heaven. Who was the angel who fell from heaven? Satan. We don't need to look that one up. You all know that. Jesus said in Luke 10, 11, I saw Satan fall from heaven. All right, so the star, the angel who fell from heaven was Satan, and the rivers and fountains of water. Go back to John chapter 7. John chapter 7 and verse 38. John chapter 7 and verse 38. Jesus is speaking to all of us. And Jesus said, He that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Okay? Jesus was teaching them that, that he is the source of truth, and that if you come to him and connect with the source of truth, then you become an extension of truth for others. And through you flows this living water of truth to others. So, fountains and rivers represent the source of truth. Write down source of truth in the answer there. Rivers and fountains are the source of truth. So, the summary reads like this. The third trumpet is a description of Satan's perversions of the teaching of the church which Jesus allowed when the church refused to obey him. It was fulfilled during the dark ages when the church abandoned scripture and ignorance and superstition and disease reigned. We studied that last time under the, the, the uh, black horse. When the church allowed uh, false doctrine to come into the church and stop being pure anymore, what happened was that Satan got a hold of the church. This great star that fell from heaven is Satan, and he fell and, and got a hold of the church. Uh, and because
because Satan was the hold of the church and and the source of life. Remember I told you he first got a hold of the leaders of the church and they began to sell offices and all that kind of thing. And because the source, the leaders that were supposed to be feeding the people, and they even made it illegal to have a Bible, because they didn't want common people to realize what they were doing. That's why they made it illegal. And so then we have the Dark Ages move in. And Satan actually gets a hold of the church. Number 11. What happened when the fourth trumpet sounded? Let me again paint the illustration. <clears throat> what happened when the fourth trumpet sounded? Verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for the third part of it, and the night likewise. Now you notice in these trumpets that, that not all is wiped out in each trumpet, but a major portion, a third is a major portion. Okay, so let's write in the answer. A third of the light went out. A third of the light went out. Alright? Now, it says a third of the sun went out. I'm going to go back in history to Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi, chapter 4, and verse 2. Malachi 4, 2. It says here, But unto you that fear my name, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. And it's S-U-N. But who's it talking about? It's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the sun. Well, now, how does the moon get its light? From the sun. It reflects the sun, doesn't it? For you and me, how do we get the light from Jesus? The Bible. Jesus is the sun, the Bible is the moon, because this is a reflection. Jesus put it here, and it comes from here to us. So the moon is the Bible, and the stars. Now, we know that stars can mean <coughs> angels, but this is obviously something that's on this earth that goes out. And so let's see if angels sometimes, or stars sometimes mean something else. Go back to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. And notice how stars is used. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. This is a descriptor of this is a description of the teachers of truth. So if, if you're a Sunday school teacher and you teach your class the truth, the Bible says you shine as the stars. You understand that? Alright, it says a third of the stars go out. So the stars are the teachers. The fourth trumpet is a description of what happened when the church accepted the false teaching under the third trumpet. It was fulfilled during the latter part of the Dark Ages when the church lost sight of Jesus' intercession for us. During the Dark Ages, remember I told you last night, they even went so far as to sell to the people this document that forgave the sins you were going to do next week. Who is the only one that can forgive sin? Jesus. The church lost sight, see, of the fact that Jesus is the one who is interceding for us. Jesus is up in heaven, and Jesus forgives us when we break the Ten Commandments, if we go to him and acknowledge that we broke them and ask for power to, you know, to obey them in the future. Jesus forgives us. But during the Dark Ages, Satan had a hold of the church, and he blotted out that part of Jesus' ministry. And you know, for a lot of people, it's still blotted out today. You know, I have a congregation, and some of my people work here and there, and then once in a while a situation comes up that they feel like a Christian just really can't be involved in. And you know what? Time after time, bosses will say to them, well, can't you go to your pastor and have him write you up a special piece of paper that says it's okay this 
time. <laughs> that happens over and over again right here in Greenleaf. <laughs> and that that was that Satan started way back there in the dark ages when Satan shut out a third of the sun. A big part of Jesus' ministry. He shut out a big part of the scriptures. And then I sure told you how that the scriptures were banned and and the only people that really had the scriptures during that time was a group of people known as the Waldensian Christians who lived way up in the mountains above Italy. As far as we know, they're the only ones that really had the scriptures. And then it says he gets rid of the, of the star, the teachers of truth. Most of the time he corrupted them with money so they didn't teach the truth anymore. And those that insisted on teaching the truth became martyrs, like we studied last night. So this is a picture, the fourth trumpet is a picture of the, of the end of the dark ages when, when, when I told you last night, 60 million people met their demise because of this darkness. Okay, and the last question, what message is John given after the fourth trumpet? And that's verse 13. Let me find my way back to Revelation here. Revelation chapter 8 and verse... 13. It says, And I beheld and heard an angel flying in the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa! 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 To the inhabitants of the earth, by the reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. What message is John given after the fourth trumpet? The message is, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And the answer is that. Now, to summarize and tie it all together, there are seven trumpets that cover the whole system. We're going to stop because that's the end of our chapter. We have covered the first four trumpets. Jerusalem was destroyed. Rome was invaded by the barbarians, the Dark Ages began, and the Dark Ages got dark. All of these were punishments that God allowed to come on his people to wake them up. Then it says, it's going to get worse. There's three more trumpets, and they're not only called trumpets, they're called woes. They're so bad. And we're going to find the fifth, sixth, and the seventh trumpet. If we would uh, take a look at where we are in our recapitulism, we have these ages, and these are the approximate dates, and these, these are the churches that we study, these are the seals that we study, and now we study the trumpet. The first trumpet kind of corresponds to the white horse in the church of Ephesus. The second trumpet corresponds to the red horse in the church of Smyrna. The third horse, or the third trumpet, which is the false doctrine coming in, corresponds to the black horse in Pergamus. And the fourth trumpet, which is the church putting itself between God and man, corresponds to the pale horse and the church of Thyatira. And we'll pick it up right there tomorrow night when we study the last three trumpets in Revelation chapter 9. And then when we get to Revelation chapter 10, we have another interlude before we go on to chapter 11. So I just know that the Lord is going to bless each one of you. And looky there, true to my word. One minute till nine o'clock.